<laughs> All right, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Michelle Green Roads here with a special, special edition uh, for Minority Health Month, everybody. Um, so come on in the room. This is a special edition. I wanted to share some things that have been on my mind for the sake of Minority Health Month. So I'll give a few moments for everyone to come in. Excited to come back live on LinkedIn. It's been a while. Just been in behind the scenes uh, at the Color Wellness, really getting things ready to launch for 2024. And so excited to let this be the start of it. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. Everyone, come on in the room. Welcome to our LinkedIn family and welcome to our YouTube family. I'm Michelle Green Rhodes, the owner and founder of the Color of Wellness Media. Yep, we are all about elevating the voice of the minority, the minority voice in healthcare. So that might be our professionals who are working inside of healthcare. Uh, as a retired nurse, registered nurse for 27 years, um, I've learned the ropes pretty much, <laughs> but was really impressed upon in a spiritual way to use my voice for our communities because of the startling statistics that we probably have seen, heard, or read over the years where most oftentimes when it comes to chronic disease and illness, minorities lead the way. And so it was important to me to say, you know what, and this is really a result of the pandemic, um, Michelle, what are you doing? Is this all about you? Is it all about your personal brand? And at the time it was, I ventured into entrepreneurship in 2017, um, but year three, four, I believe, it was impressed upon my heart to move towards my community and share the things I've learned, the things that I've seen, places I've been, things that I've done, uh, in addition to my own lived experiences, it was important to me to give back. So I pivoted, totally new company. The Color of Wellness was born. We started off as a magazine in 2020, January 20th. Uh, that actually was uh, inauguration day. We launched this magazine. And so with the help of a few of my nursing friends and shout out to those contributors, we definitely could not have launched without you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> for all that you've done and you continue to do to share voices across the world. So we are proud to be the first black wellness platform, media platform by black nurses. So with that being said, come on in the room, everybody. I'm excited to really acknowledge Minority Health Month. I was looking around. I didn't see anyone really talking about it. I know OMS does a lot when it comes to you know, Office of Minority Services or OMH, excuse me, Office of Minority Health. Uh, and so we do, of course, watch everything that they share and share a few of those things as well to our audience. But of course, as one in that space, it was important to me to do the same. So, or, or likewise. So come on in, everybody. Let's get started. This will be a special edition I want to uh, record. And so after this live today, you'll probably see recordings at noon. My goal is to be here at noon uh, on LinkedIn and YouTube daily. So you'll see them come um, on live for the next 10 days. OK, so I've just really in my mind bullet pointed 10 things that were important to me that we needed to discuss, discuss when it comes uh, to elevating the voice of health equity. And so we'll just talk about one bullet point every day, okay? So today it is the importance of self-advocacy as I wrote down, again, the 10 things that really stood out to me as to why uh, we need to talk about this during Minority Health Month. I began to think about the impact that uh, many of these things that we're gonna talk about today would have on the money that we spend in healthcare, the outcomes that we see in healthcare, uh, and then what impact would that look like on the preventative side? So what would that look like if we caught these things earlier, if we had a voice earlier, if we learned, learned um, how to be aware of certain things earlier during the process? Because again, one of the things I saw as a managed care nurse, my, my background was in managed care, um, worked as case manager, but then moved up to utilization review, meaning looking to see if it's uh, medically necessary and working with the physician to determine that. Um, really, you know, and then the last physician was a population health. So being able to move in to communities and look at what is it, what did the programming look like for populations and not just people. Uh, and that's really where the light came on, the light bulb came on when I saw the money that was spent repeatedly, the money that was not being spent and not being accessed repeatedly, um, late chronic disease um, diagnoses, late repeatedly, and it just did something to me. <laughs> and I think it's because of my personal experiences when you know, as a youth growing up, um, not having the best 
access to health care. Um, so I know what this looks like. I know what it feels like. I know what this means to not have and have to wait and have to learn and not understand uh, and not being able to get there and <laughs> not being able to afford it when you get there. What does all that look like? And so we're going to talk about this over the next 10 days. So I um, implore you to come, grab a seat. We'll be no less, no more than 30 minutes every day. Uh, my goal is to come to you during lunchtime because I really want to make sure that I at least share this with you all. All right. So let's jump right in. What is health care? Actually, I did an article this morning, too. I think this is a piece of that stirred the pot. So if you check my newsletters, if you follow my newsletters, we uh, publish a newsletter each month. And today was called, Does Healthcare Really Care? And had no intention of naming it that, but it just kind of came to me. But it made sense once I wrote the article. So if you check out the newsletter for April, you'll be able to read that and see kind of how this gels today. But the last thing I want to say before we get started is make sure you go over to our website, uh, colorofwellness.co, and you'll see our free magazine. You'll be able to listen to our podcast network. So make sure you click on podcast network because our goal is to get a wellness education. So really on the prevention side, that preventative type of education out to minority um, populations where they need it right at the point where they need it, meaning right on their phones, right on their computers, digital. They can get it right away. It's free and it's easy to access. We earn our income through ads and through trainings. So if you wanted to support us, you know, have your ads go through us or bring us into training to train your staff, your workforce on the importance of, of course, health equity, but culturally competent care, what that does. Uh, and you'll see that reflected in your outcomes or you'll see it reflected in your money and you'll see it reflected in the patient satisfaction. Right. Um, and we're going to talk about that. Let's get started. <laughs> All right. So does healthcare really care? Do they even care? Do they think? Of, I know we know that it's a it's a business. We know that it's about that. Again, the costs that, that are involved uh, are the costs being exceedingly high. Are we able to use some cost savings? Are we able to use some strategies that would end into end in cost savings? You know, what does that look like for us? So this first piece is going to talk about the importance of self advocacy. Why is it important for us to teach patients how to advocate for themselves? Because, of course, as nurses, we're professional caregivers, but it's so easy, and I'm guilty of this as well, to do it all for them, to do as much as we can for them. But, of course, while we do that, there are things we have to share, teach, um, make sure they understand along the way so they can take that information and utilize it later, right? So easy to say, not always so easy to do. So let me see if I can slide. I'm doing something new today with slides. Uh, but yeah, hopefully you can see this. You can just take a screenshot if you can't. Uh, and I believe many of us probably know some of this information, but it will come back to you. Hopefully this will be some tips, some something that's useful, a tip that you can use when you're really working with your patients or your workforce that they can implement at the bedside. But in it is so important for us to empower our patients uh, to advocate for themselves. Now, one thing we're going to talk about in this series is that, of course, the found underneath the self-advocacy, uh, there has to be trust. That's really the bottom line. There has to be a level of trust before they can even receive the information. So it's easy to say, do this, do that. Do you understand this? But if I don't trust the person that's telling me what to do, then there's a barrier. And then the barriers go <laughs> on from there. But that's the foundation of all of this. So I want you to know that we're going to talk about the importance of trust as well. This is vital because without trust, we can't even really work through these steps. So hopefully you've established a good level of trust with your patients and then you're able to take this to the next step. So empower them uh, to advocate for themselves. So once you've given them the teaching, once you've talked to them about their whatever that is, whatever's in the care plan. It can be a, a multitude of things. Um, you know, it's important for us to come back and ask them, you know, if this were to happen to, again, what would you say? Uh, if the, if you could prevent this from happening again, what would you do? Uh, if you wanted more information about this particular thing, where would you go for more information? So here is the vital piece where we're able to teach them how to advocate for themselves. This alone can lead to substantial cost savings because what? We've prevented some things. We've prevented repeat uh, emergency visit. We've re prevented uh, a repeat, uh, I don't know, <laughs> rush uh, surgery because certain uh, educational uh, pieces, I can't think what I'm trying to say, <laughs> weren't adhered to. You know, when the surgery was done, they didn't do right what they were asked to do. 
Well, what does that look like? If we don't do it, hey, I'm back and I need surgery, emergency. So, you know, these are all things that are underlying the care plan. If we can't get this taken care of, the care plan is going to fall through. So I'm here to help support you all without without having to go through these barriers, hopefully lowering the barriers so we have some good outcomes. Okay, so this is important when it comes to expenses and to outcomes. Number two. Let's talk about patient safety. We know that's always at the top of the list. It actually, needs to be number one, <laughs> safety first, right? So we want also our patients to be safe at all times. We want them to have the best outcomes, right? We've said that already. But now we have this, again, self-advocacy coming in to contribute to a safer healthcare environment. We can ask those, again, pertinent questions. We're helping to increase their confidence, y'all. How many of you know confidence is everything? How many of you know confidence is everything? If we are not confident in what we're saying, what we're doing, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can do that. I don't remember. I'm fearful. I don't have. I can't do. What's the number? Where do I go? Ah, uh, forget it. That's what we're going to see when it comes to, you know, the patient moving forward. So at home, it could be not safe. But when it comes to being safe inside of the hospital, let's talk about this for a moment. We know what this feels like, right? If the patient doesn't feel safe. But let me talk about how this connects to culturally competent care. Because if we haven't, and this is just hopefully not, not happening, but <laughs> the numbers say otherwise. But if we were not listening to our patient and what they said they prefer or what they can't tolerate or what they don't want to have done or what they don't believe in. Now we've overlooked their voice. We didn't hear that. We just knew that care plan said this, but we didn't take into consideration those culturally, cultural nuances, right? So we now kind of stepped over their belief system and just plummeted through what this on that care plan as opposed to helping them advocate for themselves and you've been an advocate for them. So let's make sure we're not over listening or forgetting or missing out on what's been verbalized to us when it comes to patient safety. We want to make sure we've taken into consideration all of those things when it comes to their care. And again, they will tell you what that looks like. It could be, again, uh, from as small as a dietary concern. But of course, literacy is always huge because sometimes that is a big piece. We're going to talk about that this week. It's not just understanding, just not understanding. This is a very complex jargon field um, profession that we're in. So it's important that they understand. If they don't understand, again, it's not heard, it's not seen, and now we're moving into safety issues. Number three, let's talk about patient satisfaction. <laughs> Can't talk about anything else without talking to, about this piece. And again, it's important because it kind of guides us. It shows us the way. It shows us what we've done right, what we've done wrong, or the perception of there, thereof, I should say. The perception thereof. How many of us know perception is everything? So before, we talked about with the patient, confidence was everything, right? But now we're talking about the outcomes for the facility. Now, if they, if patient satisfaction is everything, what do we do to help facilitate that? We've talked about safety. We've talked about belief systems. Now let's talk about what does this look like when we were a year back. And this uh, hands, I'm, I'm just kind of showing you what it looks like for them to read, maybe um, to maybe fill out their survey. Now, of course, I believe it's all digital, but just look at what their hands are going to write. What, are the, what is their mouth going to say about your facility or the workforce that took care of them? But on the other hand, if they felt heard, respected, involved, they were inside of the decision making process, what does that look like? It feels like, excuse me, better um, outcomes and, of course, satisfaction. All right. So also when it comes to self-advocacy, number four, the fourth reason why we need to teach our patients how to self-advocate, because it underlyingly helps promote health equity, which is the goal for all hospitals, all healthcare systems, and I say that because it's a requirement of Jacob and or the commission. We are charged with, hey, we want that designation, want to be seen as a safe, um, excellent place to go for care, then health equity is now is requirement. So if you are promoting health equity within your uh, policies, procedures, uh, inside of your strategic plan for the year for that hospital, now we are on the right track. So we can do this. We can do this together. We can 
ingrain health equity into everything that we do. So self equity does play a crucial role in addressing disparities. All right, so it must be implemented into the very culture, uh, but we also are leaving, again, that patient with a sense of pride, confidence, and ability to speak up for themselves, especially when it comes to something that they may uh, feel a loss at. They may feel like there's no resources available. They may feel like I don't have the answers, and they feel just that confidence is not there, right? But you giving them those opportunities, those resources are helping to help increase health equity. All right. And if you need more information about that, I'm happy to help you with that. We have resources ready and available through the Color of Wellness, which is really, I didn't even talk about the company. Uh, I'll talk about it in just a moment, but that's what we are all about is providing culturally competent resources so patients feel connected, they feel understood, and we can help you decrease the cost out of the outspend. All right. When it comes to your patient care. All right, so lastly, we talked about this very briefly earlier when it comes to teaching your patients how to advocate for themselves. Of course, trust is the foundation, okay? We always hear communication is everything. So in our training for the Train the Trainer that we've now released through our Color Wellness Institute, we teach how to build trust. We teach five ways to communicate. And that's not just uh, like speaking, right? So I feel I feel like it's called a like a forward speech, but it's also internal. It's how do you take in communication? So it's a two-way street that we teach you based on our framework. It's called the Wavy Framework. And there's five ways that we enhance communication and it's so vital. So when it comes to our patients speaking up for themselves, we know that trust is the foundation. We know that communication is everything and that's just them speaking to us and feeling empowered to speak. Some patients are scared. They are scared. We know about white coat syndrome. We just don't want to hear it. We don't want to hear it. They don't want to, you know, go through it. It's painful. It's, it's all the things it's everything for them. So we have to be that, you know, that partner as we co-create this experience uh, for them to get the care they need, for them to feel confident and moving forward in their care plan, that there's a trust there that this, you know, healthcare team is going to not just take care of me acutely, but even the things they've given to me as a uh, post, you know, acute discharge, uh, information, resources, um, the plan that continues. What does that look like? Who's going to partner with me when I go back home so I don't have to come back to the ER? So there is not another readmission, right? The color of wellness is here. We are the health educators for you all. We are giving you digital resources that are right at the fingertips that the patients can use and go forward with in their care plan. Now, what you all see on our website, let me just say this really quickly, is a very general magazine. It's just general health education so that those who read it can either say, hey, let me take this to my doctor. Uh, I haven't heard of this before. I haven't heard, you know, this type of health goal or this type of food or this type of supplement, whatever that might be. And they are, it's just a resource to help them, you know, have that conversation with their primary care uh, provider. However, what we're all speaking of today is on our institute side where we do create bespoke, um, customized solutions. Uh, so meaning if it's um, the biggest thing, problem that you see in your organization is um, repeat with, let's just say, prediabetes or uh, just, of course, we know lifestyle changes are the biggest. Uh, there might just be a, a problem there where we just can't get certain things under control. Then we will create those resources, especially for your uh, organization. So it just depends on what the biggest concern is for your organizations. And we've done this, we've seen this with our clients with just simple education that's bespoke. So meaning because every community is different, right? Every community has different needs. Every hospital has different needs. And so they're, again, with that managed care background helped me <laughs> be able to look at the data and say the number one problem here is this. Let's create some resources, some education around this particular problem. I'll give you another example. We we see so many concerns when it comes to minority uh, health, but we know um, breast cancer is a concern. So we've been, you know, charged to connect with an organization that wants to get more information to minority women for their mammography needs. So it's a problem. It's a concern. It's not being done. It's not being, it's done too late, which of course, there we are, right? The outcomes sometimes can lead to better to worse outcomes. Uh, that outcome of having a late mammography, I should say, can lead to worse outcomes where the diagnosis is concerned because it wasn't done 
so earlier. So um, that's just a simple example of how we create bespoke you know, education so that these women and the minorities in that community can understand the importance of mammography. Okay, so that's an example of uh, one of our magazines and of course the uh, newly launched ECC, it's our Equitable and Com Culturally Competent Care Institute. I'm so, so proud to spearhead this based uh, with the combined team of over 50 years of experience in nursing. Uh, this is a wellness institute. We want to be the hub. We want to be your go-to when it comes to getting messaging out to the masses. It was only so much I can do as one person, but when it comes to media, that's the beauty of media. We can use it for the good. We can flip it and say, hey, here's education that you might need, you might consider, or take this to your primary care to have this conversation. All right, so for those of you all who are wanting more formal training, and of course we'll be here for the next 10 days just so you get to know, like, and trust us, but we are having our second uh, Train the Trainer um, five-day uh, program. And it's coming up the week of May 20th. So I wanted to share that with you. Uh, just reach out to me. You can message me. I put my email there if you want to set up a time to talk. I'll happily send over my um, my calendar link. And let's have a conversation. Let's talk about uh, your educators, whomever that leads that education in your organization coming to this training. It is a train the trainer so they can take it back and implement it into your culture. Okay, so I'm excited about May 20th. We're excited to see your educators, your best and brightest in the room for the sake of health equity and the, for the sake of trust. That's really what it's all about. All right, I'll see you all tomorrow with the next segment of Does Healthcare Care? <laughs> and uh, get to the bottom of this and have some solutions for you that you can use right there right at the point of care at the time that's needed the most, okay? Onward and upward, everyone. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend, and thanks for your time today. I'll see you soon. Bye.